Awesome, thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, as Jennifer said, my name is Krista Lopez. Um, Jennifer and I did meet at a Fannie Mae event in Washington, D.C. back in 2019. And so we've been talking in this space about disaster recovery and block grants and all the challenges with all of that. So I want to share a little bit of my history um, and then I'm going to have the panel introduce themselves. Um, and I'm short, so I stand up when I talk because those folks won't see me over camera, so apologize. Um, but uh, I started, oh gosh, I moved to Austin, Texas in 2002. And back when I moved to Austin, um, I started as a firefighter, an EMT, and search and rescue. And so I was a professional first responder uh, in the volunteer space, but still professional for 20 years in Austin. Um, so I have a lot of respect for the folks that talked yesterday, for what's been happening here in the community. And, you know, I know my first disaster that I responded to was the Space Shuttle Columbia as it crashed uh, from California over into the state of Texas. And so I've seen a wide variety of disasters and the impact it has on communities. Um, at the same time, I was working full time in a university in Texas. And I served as my final role there as the director of student emergency services. So I worked with folks in crisis and in trauma. So for the folks that talked about mental health yesterday, um, that was my space as well. Um, then I went on to work for the State Division of Emergency Management. I was a planner looking at preparedness activities and then worked on the individual assistance program with my FEMA counterparts over probably eight to nine federally declared disasters up through Hurricane Harvey. And then this wonderful woman um, and her counterpart, Pete, approached me in the middle of Hurricane Harvey and said, we need you to help us with housing um, for Hurricane Harvey. And that's how I moved over into the CDBG DR space. A couple months ago, I had a family crisis come up where I had to switch careers because uh, I loved the folks I worked with. Um, so I've now moved. I'm uh, from, I live in North Carolina now, uh, and I work for Deloitte. Um, so I work for a consulting firm, not one of those bad people out looking for money, uh, really truly still a first responder and servant at heart. That's where I start, and that's my base, and it will always be who I am. But I give you that perspective um, because my bachelor's degree is in horticulture, y'all. Um, I get the reason why wildfire is so important to our plants and to our environment and our space. My first master's is in counseling, that mental health piece of things. My second master's and my PhD work on emergency management and public policy. Degrees are not the answer to everything, but they sure helped me along the way, help citizens in our community. Um, so I give that little bit of background to you so you kind of know where my thought process comes from, um, but also where my experiences lie. So I'm gonna turn it over to my panel, and I'll let Michael start. Great, thank you. Uh, am I live, testing, coming across? Uh, Michael Mortar, thank you. Um, former uh, state employee with the state of Oregon. A um, little bit of my background and in, in, in reference here. Uh, PhD where I grew up was post hole digger. So I am a first and foremost uh, farm and ranch kid. And I've always held that close in heart in public service. So I started out um, in public service. I worked 10 years uh, in two states as a legislative aide in Alaska and Oregon. Then I moved, when we moved to Oregon, um, shifted gears from that legislative side after a couple of years to executive branch service. And what I found as a 30 year public servant is that there's always an opportunity to lean in. And as a result of that, um, I've had perhaps what's different than most, what most people think of as the classic bureaucratic career. Um, been given an opportunity to literally lean into every single step, every job I was offered was a challenge. There was a crisis and I needed to step in. First was with the insurance commissioner. Uh, we had a medical malpractice crisis at the time, contractor liability insurance and a workers' compensation war that was really ugly and helped navigate that both politically and from the regulatory environment. The next step in my career was to go to the state building codes division um, where I um, really cut my teeth in local government and the complexities around building code regulation, but doing it in a reasonable way and with thought to both your stakeholders on the local side and local government, but also from the construction side. And how do you bridge those gaps between what makes sense and what's possibly required? So, uh, and then the, the last stop before I entered my uh, job as a recovery ombudsman 
was we had this disaster in Oregon that was not fire related, it was public policy called Cover Oregon. And our effort at a health exchange went underwater quickly and I was a handful of staff that course corrected that and resurrected the health insurance exchange. So fast forward to a few years ago, I was asked to um, go over to the emergency command center. I was then, I had just returned to work for the insurance commissioner, said we think we need you to go over for like two or three weeks. Well, that turned into really the better part of two years. And I ended up serving in fairly short order. Uh, the governor appointed a state wildfire recovery director, Matt Garrett, who had tremendous legislative respect as a former ODOT leader. And I was, in essence, his right hand um, on the built environment side. So my job as recovery ombudsman was to find those barriers at the local level in both building, planning, wetlands, wherever that might be, whatever the resources were needed, and really lean into that and get, try to get the agencies involved to yes. And I, I know having worked closely with my stakeholders in the McKinsey, in the Sanium, in Sa and in Southern Oregon, it's not easy to get to yes. And so that, uh, that position, uh, my position as ombudsman uh, came to a close, but I, I made a promise to those locals that I wasn't going away. And so hung up my shingle for state service, but I'm now a wildfire consultant, whatever that may bring. So, thank you. Great, I guess I'll go next. Um, Larry Florin, I'm the CEO of Burbank Housing. We're a nonprofit based here in Sonoma County. Um, been around for 42 years. Um, we've built over 5,000 units of affordable housing and currently own and run and manage about 4,000 units. And so, you can imagine when the wildfires came, we were both impacted some of our properties. Uh, fortunately, uh, none of our properties were damaged in the wildfires, but we certainly had mass evacuations at uh, many of our properties that were behind the lines uh, at the time. But prior to that, I actually have had a fair amount of experience in disasters dating back to 1989. I really am old. Um, the Loma Prieta earthquake, I worked for Mayor Art Agnos at that time, and um, we were, I still remember this very vividly after the earthquake. We knew nothing about uh, response, never mind recovery. We drove around at the time the Presidio looking for the FEMA offices. It was one office in the old army base there. One guy was manning, the, one man was manning the office there. Everybody else had left to go to North Carolina for some disaster. And they said, uh, give us your phone number, we'll get back to you. And about three days later, FEMA responded um, to the disaster. But so go, Things have changed very dramatically since then. Fortunately, I had a stint as a county administrator in Napa County. We had, I think, five disasters over seven years for a uh, federally declared disaster, starting with um, the South Napa earthquake and the Valley Fire, and I'm gonna forget the names of the others. I learned how to eat 2,000 calorie sandwiches uh, that were brought to us by OES um, when we lived in the uh, command center. But in 2015, I left county service and took over running this nonprofit um, that is building affordable housing in. Um, what you see on the screen is actually just a, sh a success story of the use of CDBG CDBGDR. Yes, there are success stories. Maybe hard to believe. Um, it was painful. I used to be a lot taller before this process started. But this was a picture up here of one of our signature projects. We actually have right now eight projects under construction. A large six of them are benefiting in one way or another, directly or indirectly, from disaster uh, funding, including other sources like the disaster tax credits that our Congressman Mike Thompson was able to secure through the for the 2017 and 2019 fires, I believe. Um, this particular picture is one of our, though, projects. I love all my, my children. I love all of our projects. This is one we're particularly proud of. It was a former mobile home park that was destroyed in the uh, 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 the North Bay fires, I guess the Tubbs fire was actually more specifically, um, there were 162 mobile homes on this 13 acre piece of property. Five people lost their lives. All of the homes were rendered uh, unoccupiable or completely destroyed. Went onto the site two days after the fires and saw this little round metal object and it had formerly been a mobile home park and it was literally about this big. It showed you how fierce and intense the fires were. Um, we worked with the property owner 
Um, ultimately worked out an agreement with them where Burbank took over the redevelopment of this site. And it was an excellent site for redevelopment because it literally is in the middle of Santa Rosa, which is a very urban environment. For any of you that go north, you'll see this, I just love the term wooey. Well, this is actually in the city itself. Um, and so we felt this was an excellent place to demonstrate what recovery could look like. Um, we had no idea how we were going to do it financially, but we start set about, and over the next five years, four years, which is relatively fast for um, an affordable housing project. Um, I'm looking at my friend Shauna, uh, who uh, couldn't appreciate that. She runs CHIPS, which is the organization in Chico, and we, we're running very parallel on these types of efforts and um, have gained a lot of insight from both of our efforts on this. But we have started, actually we're completing the first phase of construction on the redevelopment of this site. We're building 162 units of senior affordable housing. The first 96 units will come online in June. Uh, the remainder are coming online over the next six months after that. And that was on ten, three of the acres of the 13. The other 10 acres are, were sold to a market rate developer who's building uh, rental housing on that. So replacing the 162 units, mobile homes were going to be a total of 400, and I'm going to do the math on this half, 420 units of housing in an urban infill environment that's being built with resilient materials, access. I saw Gabe from the city of Santa Rosa here. He's been guiding us through this process um, and been able to um, re re rebuilding and we're really, really proud. We still have about the 162 folks who were displaced. About 36 of the seniors have been on a waiting list and we got special dispensation to allow them to move up the list so they can move back in. CDBGDR was an incredibly important part of the rebuilding effort as difficult as it was, um, as obtuse as it is, um, and there's so many issues with it that I'm sure we'll get into, but we couldn't have done it without the use of the federal funds, without CBGDR and the disaster tax credits. Um, with that, I'll shut up. <laughs> All right, well, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Heather Legrone. I'm the director of the State of Texas Disaster Recovery Programs. Uh, so uh, the State of Texas, unfortunately, uh, has impacts from disasters just about every year. We currently have nine open grants for floods, freezes, hurricanes, and wildfires at the State of Texas. Um, that is about a $13 billion portfolio that we are managing. Um, and it is in the majority CDBG funds, either disaster recovery or mitigation funds. First and foremost, I want to tell you it can be done. <laughs> I do disasters. I've been doing disasters since 2005 on behalf of the state of Texas. It actually can be done. Uh, the CDBG program is an annual allocation that Housing and Urban Development puts out. Um, and when they started putting money with the 9-11 events through the CDBG program, they did so, believe it or not, because the CDBG program was considered the most flexible program mm -hmm. <laughs> in the federal portfolio. The problem with it, of course, is it's an annual allocation, and it's an annual allocation designed to do things that are on your books, in the plans, in the works, with all the time in the world during sunny skies. Um, it is not a disaster recovery program. So first and foremost, HUD has to write a new rule book every single time Congress allocates them money. So I just told you we have nine open events right now that we are working on, um, and that $13 billion that I mentioned is governed by 23 different sets of rules. So um, it gets quite complex, quite bureaucratic, um, but I will tell you that we've done it relatively fast. I like that, Larry. <laughs> Um, we do get better. We have learned a lot as we have come forward. In 2005, it was Hurricane Rita for the state of Texas. Uh, we got hit by Hurricane Rita a matter of days after Katrina hit New Orleans. So from 2005, we've been working our way forward. And we always build better and build stronger for next time. Um, within our programs, we elevate. We win harden. 
we um, put in uh, fire resistant materials. We um, are building to a green standard. We are energy efficient uh, because we're never going to get enough money for the need that we have. Um, fast forward to 2017. In 2017, the state of Texas got hit by Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey impacted 49 counties in the state of Texas. More than two-thirds of the population of Texas were impacted by that event. 890,000 households submitted individual assistance um, requests to FEMA. So that was 890 households who said they could not recover on their own. When we did the math, we saw that that was going to cost us about $125 billion. That recovery was with the housing need as well as the infrastructure side of things was $125 billion. The state of Texas only received $5 billion. It sounds really ridiculous to say only in front of a $5 billion number. But you have to get extremely creative in the use of the funds when you get less than 5% of the allocation you need. Do you just do all housing? Well, you can do all housing. And in our case, it was a flood hurricane event. You can build about five houses, strengthen and harden them for about a million dollars. So if you strengthen in Texas, I should clarify that. In Texas, you can do that. Um, for, so if you do the math, if I spend $10 million, then I can build 50 houses. If I spend $20 million, I can build 100 houses. If I spend $20 million on a drainage project, I can potentially remove 500 houses from harm's way from a flooding event. So those decisions have to be made. You have to look for opportunities to strengthen and harden and get the most bang for your buck. And that's something that we attempt to do within our programs. And we get thank you letters in the mail. Our homeowners who we built houses for in the past call us and say, we stayed high and dry during this event. Our whole neighborhood came to our house because our house was above the flood water. So it works, and resilience is a thing. Mitigation is possible. The CDBG funds don't allow you to help the same house multiple times, so that applicant and that address is only getting one bite at the apple. And so you gotta, get, you gotta make it good. You gotta make it right the first time. I will tell you that we are definitely the bureaucrats of a disaster response and recovery. We are definitely not the heroes in the room. I have never ridden in a boat and plucked somebody off their roof, nor have I been in a helicopter and saved somebody from flooding waters. Um, we are sitting in Austin, we hear that a lot, sitting in Austin, while the disaster is occurring on our coast. We come in after the fact, unfortunately, after all the waivers have gone away. So when FEMA comes in and they're ready to help you all, they are able to help you all without benefit of procurement requirements, without benefit of prevailing wages, Uniform Relocation Act. They are not doing environmental clearances to the degree that we're required to do them. So I'll go back to relatively fast. <laughs> Getting all those ducks in a row takes a minute. Anytime I visit with elected officials or homeowners groups or any of those kinds of folks, the first thing that I usually lead with is this is going to take longer than you ever thought possible. It just takes a minute to get through all of those federal requirements that if you wanted to look at in their entirety seem ridiculous. But if I were to start picking away at them and say, does it matter if we're paying prevailing wages? You'd probably say yes. If I said, does it matter if it's environmentally cleared? Do we care if that house is in a floodplain? Probably we do. We can all debate about whether procurement needs to be that complicated, though. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, that's kind of what we do in our disaster recovery program at the state of Texas. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to talk to you all. 
And um, y'all, this weather is amazing. It's not even that great. It is 100 degrees at home. Y'all have the back doors open. This is incredible. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> this is a rare rain. Oh, rare yeah. <laughs> So this is gonna be a real free flow kind of conversation because we have three very different experiences and perspectives um, on disaster recovery and block grant and stumbling points and successes. Um, I can attest, as I mentioned, Heather and I worked together directly for the last five years, um, indirectly probably for the last 10 on disaster recovery. And I can share with you that in order to use those funds that she talked about, the amount of red tape that HUD requires is essentially 700 pages of a written report that says how a state might implement using those funds for those rules that change every single time. So for those of you who represent local governments and help local governments mitigate some of this, those, if you have multiple funding streams because of multiple disasters or multiple fires, you're gonna have different rules. And every single time you have to tweak how you're going to apply a project or work on rebuilding homes based on those new rules, it can become very cumbersome. Um, I can tell you, Heather and I spend, uh, especially Heather, but I have done my fair share of time in DC lobbying for rule changes because that's really where. <laughs> Not too many successes, but we try. Um, and what we keep being told is it has to start here. Like it has to start locally, and the federal government needs to hear locally why the rules need to change because they don't listen to us at the state level much. <laughs> they just think we're being whiny about it. So if you have that in you, this is my soapbox and plug, um, to please figure out ways to help us navigate and advocate for rule changes that make disaster recovery more seamless. As Heather mentioned, you know, by the time CDBG DR funds kick in, all those waivers that were there when FEMA was there um, go away. And so we have more layers to rules than FEMA funds do. Um, so that is certainly some challenges. But I'm gonna flip back Let's talk about some big challenges or big obstacles that each of you have kind of faced and then what you did to navigate those. And so, Mike, I'll start with you. From your sure. Uh, it, and thanks, Jen, for putting me on the panel where I'm the least expert individual. But I'm, I'm the voice of Oregon. I'm the voice of rural Oregon here. So let's do it. Yeah. Um, I think if, if I put myself in the shoes of a homeowner who, who lost their home on the McKinsey, the Sanium, down in the Alameda fire, um, the first thing I'm thinking is FEMA's here to help. Hmm. At the end of the day, if I'm lucky, I get a couple thousand dollars, if I get anything. Then I'm told, well, go to the SBA because they'll help you with the loan process. And what I learned in my role as ombudsman is that is anything but an easy process and it's unlikely to bear fruit, number two. So now I'm thinking, again, if I'm that that homeowner, um, I've read the headlines. Oregon's getting $450 million of funding. Surely that's got something for me. But if I started the recovery process, if I pulled my building permits from my friend Ted Zook in Jackson County, I'm out of luck because I've started the process too soon. And so, frankly, I mean, in no disrespect, God bless you folks for being able to navigate this, and I really want to take some lessons learned back to Oregon to try to influence our policymakers, but it, it, it just seems insurmountable from the local level. So, um, and then I guess the last thing I would offer is, and the structure in Texas sounds like it's a lot more refined, and you guys have figured out, unfortunately, because you've been hit a lot, for us, this was our first major disaster. And the agency blessed with receiving this money and dispersing it is swimming in red tape. And we talked a lot yesterday about trust. And I so appreciate those of you on the advocacy side who are leaning in to help your community members. Trust is so important. What we don't have is community trust in the system now. One, they've heard all this money coming the state agency involved in, in getting that money out does not have trust, does not have local trust. And so 
it's, um, it's big. Thank you. And just to tap onto that, Michael, I think um, that trust is key, and that trust is important for our local officials and our state officials to trust their counterparts. Because I don't know how many times when I was working for the state of Texas, I'd see a disaster in another state, and I would reach out to somebody there and say, do you need our help? Mm -hmm. we've, we've hit these barriers. Please don't repeat what we've had to go through. Yep. Call me, ask me for help. And I think when you're in the midst of an event, because I've been through crisis myself, you see everything right here. And it's too hard to ask for help because you can't see out here just yet, right? But if folks can plan now for who they might call upon in the future for that help, that will go a long way because that will help, one, you've developed a relationship so now you have trust. Um, but two, you can learn from them in the future. Um, so I encourage folks to think about in the, in the light of resilience, you know, to me, we talked about resilience yesterday. It's that ability to bounce back a little bit quicker each time, right? It's that ability to use the tools that you have to pull from those local resources. We heard from some of our indigenous folks yesterday who have incredible resources and tools we should be tapping into now, right? And building those relationships and that trust. Same thing with other partners across the country. How do we build that relationship and that trust now so that we have those tools and resources later on? So thank you for that. Larry. Oh, well, um, so we, I think we were the first uh, recipient of CWDGR, uh, and I'm talking about Northern California in particular, for wildfire disasters. The, previously, it was all focused on floods, um, hurricanes, and the like, and so a lot of the rules were written specifically based on those types of disasters. Um, we were told early on, by the way, that um, we should be in touch with um, say of Texas, I've, take a little bit of, uh, we, we were told that Texas lobbies every month, they send a group, and I know you're not allowed to lobby, <laughs> but you send a month group every month to Washington, D.C. to make sure that, yeah, it was a little <laughs> bit of an exaggeration, but I, I got, we got the point. Um, actually, I first got to know Jennifer through a predecessor of this organization called Rebuild North Bay, which was created by a group of local, um, really by, one individual who is very politically connected, he is, he is a lobbyist, he's also a real estate investor, and he got, gathered a lot of the non-governmental business folks together and said, we want to help in some way, and we want to figure out a way to be able to help move this process along. And so he created this group called the Rebuild North Bay Foundation. He was smart enough to put some big bold names on the, on the uh, bold letter names on the board that got attention in Washington, because one of the first things we did was go to Washington to lobby for resources, CDBGDR being the resource specifically that we were lobbying for. We were told at the time that that it was being held up by the White House. Um, it, had, it had already been appropriated by Congress. It was being held up by the White House. And they had some policy issues that they were trying to resolve around. And this was the Trump administration. So we got on a plane, and it was uh, Michael Mandavi. He may have drank his wine at some point. And so he's well known. Uh, a lot of folks who may not realize this in Washington love wine. And so everybody took to the <laughs> chance to be able to meet with Michael. Um, we found ourselves in the private offices of we actually met with, um, on our first trip there, we met with uh, Mick Mulvaney, who at the time was the uh, chief of staff to the president, um, to talk about disaster to CDBGDR. Um, and he was sharing with us what some of the concerns that the president had at the time about the allocation. We were able to, to really educate him a little bit better. And as a result, literally a week after we left, the White House lifted its hold on the CDBGDR. So we saw some real action. But the other part of that, which was also informative to this process, was um, Kevin McCarthy at the time was majority leader. The Republicans were in charge of the House. Um, and uh, the majority leader called, he met with us, but not just met with us, he called together the chairs of all the appropriations committees um, in the House. And one of the chair, I think Ken Culvert was the chair of one of the committees, he turned to us and said, we'll make the allocation of resources but we don't think the state of California will be able to spend them. And he just started listing the litany of issues that would come with trying to get these funds allocated. And he was absolutely right. Um, the 
bureaucracy to get this money out was really unbelievable. Um, this, the fire started in 2000, occurred in 2017, this particular fire. You know, we've had subsequent ones, but the allocation, we, um, I think we got about a $180 million allocation for that fire from CDBGDR. It was over four years before those funds actually, and we were actually the first, our organization was actually the first recipient of CDBGDR funding for the project that I showed earlier. Um, in total, we've been the recipient of almost $30 million in CDBGDR funding, but it has been such a long process to get there. Um, and you don't just have the federal regulation, so I heard what you're saying about prevailing wage and environmental rules. I, I still feel like they need, this can't be business as usual. They really do have to think about waiving those, um, those regulations. The state of California, and I don't know about Oregon or Texas, but the state of California then imposes a whole other layer because somebody, the way I would put it is somebody somewhere at some time misused funds. Yep. And so we're going to overcompensate to make sure that none of us look bad. Um, it's kind of the classic cover your ass, which I can say having been in government for 20 years, I'm very familiar with, this kind of a cover your ass mentality. Um, we fought really hard with the state of California, um, and I'm looking at Gabia because the city of Santa Rosa was very instrumental in this, to be able to get local control over how those funds would be spent. They actually agreed to something they agreed to once, they've since rescinded that, um, but it was to give local jurisdictions the ability to determine which projects were the highest priority for those communities, and those were the ones that would receive the DR. Other than typically, those come from the state, and the state is one step removed. They have their own issues that are really separate and apart. So being able to get local control over those was a really, really critical part of that. I'll, I'll shut up after this, but I just got a call a couple of weeks ago from the head of the housing department, housing community development department for the state of California, and he wanted to know why all the CDBGDR funds were not being expended. Well, a lot of the funds were allocated towards individual homeowners who had gaps in their insurance or were, trying, or were underinsured or you name it. And so they were, the money was sort of $65 million was set aside to help those homeowners and it just wasn't being accessed. Well, the problem was that the rule said that you can't have done work, you'd be in violation of NEPA regulations if you were yeah. too far along on this. And so basically you're asking people to stand still and do nothing until they get these funds, which could be three to four years out. And so a if lot of these, arrives. if they arrive, yeah. So there, there are definitely, it's not the glamorous stuff, but there is absolutely the need to look at a serious look at the rules and regulations around, not just the federal level, but in our case, the state level too, to look at this as not business as usual, but really how do we get this out to those who are most in need as quickly as possible. Like that. Thank you for that. I'm sure Heather has some thoughts too. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, we've all talked about it. Um, this frankly defies logic. <laughs> there is an absolute sequence to how these funds have to be utilized. And Michael and Larry both touched on it. If you get too far off of that path, then you could literally not be able to use these funds for the need that you have. So there's a sequence to that. And the state of California has reached out to us. We work with them pretty regularly. Um, we often share between our organizations. This is the form that I use for duplication of benefit for our single family housing program. I gave it to you in Word. Take Texas off of it, put California on it, start using it. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. If it's working for us, then check your regs, because they may be different than mine but it probably will work for you as well. So there are some national organizations, Molly Keller, who's my colleague here with me today, and I got a chance to go to um, a cause to count the Council of State Community Development Agencies <laughs> annual conference last week. There were 39 different states there and we were all talking about disaster recovery among each other and how we can make disaster recovery work within the current requirements. There is hope because the, uh, the, the Congress has seen that they are having to take action on an annual basis, if not more frequently, for supplemental allocations for disaster recovery. And it's never fast enough. 
And so they get the, they get the calls that then translate to us that then we have to run down the answers for. But they get the calls and they keep getting the calls. So we've had several starts and stops for codification of the CDBGDR program. So instead of falling on that annual program that I talked about earlier, where it's kind of a CDBG light with extra requirements thrown in for good measure, times 23 in our case, um, it would be an actual rule book and HUD couldn't change the rules from event to event. Congress couldn't change the rules from event to event when they're allocating funds. And you could know ahead of time what roles you were gonna be subject to. Because right now, we do have to write an action plan. That action plan is averaging right now about 500 pages. And it is 500 pages because we have a checklist of things that must be in that document. Then we have to take that action plan out for public comment. That public comment is 30 to 45 days generally. Then we have to hand it over to HUD for a 60-day approval process. And that's only after Congress allocated those monies on the average six months after our event. So here we are nine months out from an event and the money's not even in our state yet. The money's not even mm -hmm. here yet. It doesn't come with any money associated with it. So if you're a brand, brand new grantee like California, and you don't have a pot of money that you can lean on in the interim, you're dead in the water until HUD gives you access to those funds. So nine months in, you're just waiting for that money to come along. In Texas, what we did is we've kind of robbed Peter to pay Paul. We kind of borrow money from our previous grants to get started. So we start taking applications while we're going through that process. But again, we're an operational agency. We do disasters. So we have people who have that expertise, who can stop what they're doing on the current grant to work on the next grant. Here in California, y'all didn't have that in place. So not only were you having to create a 500-page document, you were having to staff a 500-page document and then start writing that document. So. Um, Hopefully, this codification will simplify that document. It will require HUD to publish the rules on a timely basis. It will establish an office at HUD to focus on disaster recovery and not have us just roll up under a field office or even a headquarters office who had a full-time job before they got the disaster allocation. So there's, there is a light at the end of this tunnel if codification can move forward. It has been attached to a bill in the House. Um, a congressman from uh, Texas, Al Green, has drafted an amendment to a current bill, and it has um, some legs, at least, on the House side. It was a very partisan amendment that was added to that document, but it did pass. On the Senate side, there's a senator, Senator Schatz from Hawaii, they had volcanoes. He was also displeased with how long it took to see the allocation come to his impacted areas. He has a companion bill that if we can get them both through both sides in the current Congress before the end of the year, then there's a possibility for reconciliation and codification to occur. It still won't be fast enough, but looking at it and having done this for a minute, I think that it could abbreviate the process by as much as a year. So we could see money on the ground a year quicker than we're currently seeing it. So yes, we don't lobby because we're state employees, <laughs> but you can. <laughs> so there are some opportunities as you all are visiting with your delegation, as you all are visiting with your mayors and judges and even county commissioners and what have you, to make sure that they understand that this is a priority for recovery. Because like my colleagues have said, it doesn't work right now. We can absolutely navigate it, we can absolutely make it work in Texas, but it shouldn't be this hard. Yeah, and to add to that, you know, as Heather was saying, timeline-wise, I think back to when Texas and anyone who was affected by a disaster in 2017, uh, 2015, 16, HUD decided to give mitigation funds. 
and we received notice August of 2019. We did that whole action plan writing. We had to translate it into 13 different languages at the time. Uh, public comment, then re you have to respond to every single public comment. So even if it's, I don't like what you wrote, thank you so much for your feedback, you have to respond to everything. Then you give that whole big packet over the HUD, as Heather said, they have their timeline to respond to it. And then that time in which, you know, like Oregon, who you know, hadn't experienced it before, waits for that money to be available, that's called it signing your grant agreement. So it took us, again, back up to August 2019, it took us until Jan end of January, beginning of February of 2021 to sign that grant agreement. That was money assigned in 2019 for 2015, 16, and 17 disasters. So you count back from 2015 to signing a grant agreement in 2021 to be able to start spending money. That's why these rule changes are important. Um, and I do want to put a plug in. Um, there are some groups that are also advocating for changes to housing programs, both at the FEMA level and HUD level. Um, I was part of talking to um, Representative Titus. She runs a subcommittee. She's based in Nevada, runs a subcommittee um, in DC, and we are doing the Disaster Survivor Fairness Act. So all of you who are disaster survivors and tired of retelling your story for the millionth time to fill out paperwork that's absolutely redundant because you just gave it to everybody else, that's what we're trying to reduce as well. Because we know that that too is a barrier to getting access to these wonderful programs that come along at some point. Um, so it's important to be a part of all of that, to engage with that. Um, I know we're short on time, uh, we're getting close uh, to about five minute mark. So I want to give an opportunity for some final words and thoughts too. Actually, I just want to jump in on yeah. one other program that um, we, in the course of our going to Washington, was a really uncovered for us by one of the staff members we met with who pulled me aside afterwards and said, you know, there's on the books that the IRS has these ability to issue these called disaster tax credits. And um, here in the state of California, and it's th true throughout the US, 90% of what affordable homes or publicly subsidized affordable homes that are built are built using tax credits. We were able to get a $100 million allocation, which really translated into a billion dollars because they're 100 millions over 10 years. And I'm not gonna give you a lecture on tax credits because that'll put everybody to sleep. But, but this was a huge boom for us. And it was something that we really discovered almost by accident. It had been 2002, it had been written into the IRS tax code for, um, must have been, I don't know what was in 2002, but Katrina maybe? Um, anyway, it was written in there, it had only been used one other time in the state of Kentucky, think Senator McConnell, um, and then we were able to discover these, and now we've been able to get two of these disaster tax credits. It really kick-started us process. And that's a great point. So in mm -hmm. Texas, Heather and I advocated for um, a policy at the state level where they could not increase property taxes on the houses mm -hmm. we built under CDBGDR for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Because if you're working to provide affordable housing following a disaster to our low to moderate income households, the last thing you wanna do is build them a house that they can't afford in a year because their property taxes have gone up. So that's something at a local level and at a state level to take into consideration in rulemaking to put some, some parameters into place to protect those individuals so they're not forced out of that home that they've been provided, right? Uh, the other thing we advocated for on the code side was ensuring that renters as well as home buyers were properly being disclosed any threats and hazards to that home that they're looking to buy, which those provisions were kind of in there for a while, but our renters didn't have that protection. So now if you apply to rent an apartment in the state of Texas, they are obligated to tell you, has that property ever made a claim for flood? Has it ever been flooded in a natural event? Has there been a natural event where an insurance claim has been made? So they're not even asking for, was it 500 year floodplain, 100? They're even just asking any claims. So thinking about the impact you can have here within the state is also important to how these programs play out. So closing thoughts. This has been a good conversation, at least for me. Yeah, <laughs> I could no, talk about policy all day. <laughs> no, thank you. I'm, I am, 
encouraged that there are people who've managed to develop expertise in this area. Um, I will be leaning in as best I can to get Oregon to borrow and beg where they can um, and just encourage um, my local communities to keep up the good work you're doing and know that um, we've still got a lot of work ahead and uh, there's a hearing this Friday in front of the House Wildfire Committee and we just need to keep full court press. Local voices need to be heard. The state needs to respond to you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I just. It's, it's a long process. Um, it's a tough process to get through, but being on the other end now of the recipient of these processes, it really can be transformative if you use them and you leverage them correctly. There's no question there needs to be major reform on the way that these uh, are allocated, the times in particular, the rules that are put in place, but really you, you can be used as an opportunity to be able to define the communities that you're redefining the communities that were impacted. In our particular case, we've we're building over a thousand units right now of affordable housing, most of which are being funded um, with, disa with disaster related funds. And it's for each of the communities involved, it's gonna be a transformative act to be able to build those. Yeah, and like, like my colleagues have said, it, it can be done and it does work. Um, in the state of Texas, we have built between our single family program and our multifamily program in excess of 30,000 units um, coming back into the state of Texas that were damaged or destroyed um, by our various disaster events over the years. Um, there, are, there are great opportunities within the program. Believe it or not, it is more flexible than a lot of programs at the federal government because you can do such a wide range of things. We didn't touch on it today at all. You can do public services. You can do economic development. Um, we've created 1,100 jobs in the last year with our economic development programs. Uh, you can do infrastructure, strengthening, hardening, those types of things with these dollars as well. You just have to be aware of that sequence mm -hmm. and you have to follow the process to get to these dollars until somebody can improve it at least. <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening. Uh, looking forward to the great conversation the rest of the couple of days. Mm -hmm.